Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our event. We will be starting shortly. No music, are we in? <laughs> yeah, Google Meets, Google Meets is a bit faulty. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next time we make sure that we use Zoom so that we can share music. Yeah, more. we should totally move away from Google. This is... No, I'm just joking, but yeah. Hey Andrew, don't see for chai. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Islamic Fintech Disruptive Opportunities in the Malaysian Market. We're really glad that you decided to join us this afternoon. So before we begin, um, I would like to invite Zerhan, uh, who is the Senior Manager of FWD Technology and Innovation Malaysia, to give us a brief introduction of FWD Setup Studio, which is the organizer of the event today. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you, you know, fellow guest speaker, uh, Dr. Salim, uh, Ms. Afa, and uh, Inchik Zukifli. No, thank you so much for, you know, for setting us up time um, you know, to share with us you know, all the opportunities right, you know, that, that we have uh, in the Islamic FinTech. Um, just very quickly, you know, we would like to just introduce you know, FWD and, and FWD Startup Studio. Right? The Startup Studio is actually a, an initiative um, under FWD uh, where we would like to work with the ecosystem, especially with the startups, um, in you know, unearthing and, and finding you know, destructive uh, technologies right? you know, um, in, in the fintech space um, where we would be able to, you know, one, um, improve or, or enhance the digital products and, and digital service delivery um, you know, to our customers. Uh, two, is to be able to, you know, again, you know, with those innovation, um, look for opportunities you know, to serve the underserved segment. Um, and last but not least, right, you know, is to, is to enhance, you know, uh, to, to bring in more um, innovation into the entire ecosystem for Malaysia. And so, so that, in a nutshell, is what you know, the Startup Studio is all about. And you know, in collaboration with uh, 1337 Ventures, now, we are working very closely on you know, a you know, series of events. And you know, with that, we are also you know, launching our um, third cohort, actually, right? Now we're in our third cohort of the, the pre-accelerator program, where we will be working, you no, know, we will be inviting um, for applications, you know, for, for founders and, and, and people with ideas in this in this uh, area. And uh, the selected 25 you know, startups you know, who we think you know, with a lot of potential. We will work with you for the next 12 weeks you know, to bring um, your idea you know, into at least an MVP you know, by the end of 12 weeks. 
um, and of course the, the the top two that we felt you know um, which is most relevant and and and, um, and could bring in you know the most impact you know we would potentially you know invest um, in in your no, so thank you very much. Now I'll hand it over back to um, No Way In and the team from 137. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Zahan. So without further ado, I would like to introduce all of you to our first speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Kinan Salim. So just a brief introduction, uh, Dr. Kinan Salim leads the iConnect FinTech in Islamic Finance at NCF, where he works with industry players, researchers, regulators, and civil society to create disruptive innovations in Islamic FinTech. Dr. Kinan brings 15 years of experience in Islamic finance, sustainable finance, and fintech. He serves as an advisor on Islamic fintech and sustainable finance and provides services to leading financial institutions and fintech startups in Southeast Asia and the Middle East. His research and consultancy focus on designing frameworks and providing capacity building for innovative policies and products for Islamic fintech, financial inclusion, and sustainable finance. So without further ado, Dr. Kinan, please take the stage. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and thank you very much for inviting us today. Uh, I can see um, the audience, many of them uh, familiar names, uh, good startups, Islamic fintech startups at, from Takafel Company, from some of them from Accelerator Program and also from uh, regul regulators and uh, supporting uh, government institutions for the fintech and Islamic fintech. So I believe um, you make my task a little bit difficult today because I believe uh, most of you, you have more information uh, than uh, what I have. Uh, but then it is, uh, this is the, the place where it bring everybody together and share the information and benefit from each other. So, um, uh, let me introduce a little bit about um, uh, the um, the Islamic fintech ecosystem in Malaysia, and why while I'm sharing my screen here. Um, okay, oh, let's, yeah. Can you see my screen? Um, no, we can't see it. Okay, yeah, we can see it now. Can okay, great, great. So. Basically, what we are uh, talking about, uh, we're talking about an ecosystem for an Islamic fintech in Malaysia. And this is where the concept of iConnect and uh, the reason that first, uh, because I'm leading the iConnect project um, in collaborative with the industry partners and uh, regul regulators and uh, institutions, academic institutions and civil society institutions as, as well. The main idea of the icon architecture is to develop the homegrown high value innovation in fintech for Islamic finance. And that's be done by bridging the gap between the R and D institutions and the business partners through knowledge based innovation. The main idea here is actually to create an, a conducive ecosystem, a conducive innovation ecosystem that address the pain point that required demand driven R and D and to establish a fund to foster the innovation and collaboration in Islamic FinTech. Now, the main idea of this actually is to have, we have a shared vision for this, which is bring Malaysia as a global Islamic FinTech disruptive innovation hub. Now, um, why, why, I'm, why I'm, I'm bringing uh, this background? I want to talk about the outlook of uh, FinTech in Malaysia and then the outlook of Islamic FinTech in Malaysia in general, and then try to dive deeply a little bit on what are uh, the key pillars for the ecosystem and where the things need to be uh, uh, progressed, where the things, where the opportunities that we can uh, get and we can tap on, especially for the Islamic FinTech startup. And of course, some of the challenges that uh, we may face uh, as an Islamic FinTech startup and then how we can work together, collaborate together to overcome this, uh, these uh, challenges. Now, in general, as you know, uh, in, in fintech, Malaysia has been uh, doing, trying to doing uh, uh, the best level on this. Uh, currently, we are on like um, number sixty nine on the global fintech ranking for twenty twenty one. Uh, Kuala Lumpur has been ranked as uh, as uh, number fifteen in uh, regional in in Asia. So um, there are some good, I would say, uh, good bases for for fintech. 
Now, when it comes to, let's say, um, to the hub or what is, what is unique with Malaysia, so of course, uh, many people will focus directly on Islamic fintech. And the main reason for that, because Islamic finance is um, a hub in Malaysia, Malaysia is leading Islamic finance uh, globally. So it is a very good position to be leading Islamic fintech as, as well. And uh, this is what's happened actually. In recently, last year, we have uh, a report by Global Islamic Fintech Report where Malaysia has been ranked number one uh, in the Islamic in the Islamic fintech market, um, uh, bleeding uh, and uh, like um, in in advance of countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE, Indonesia, and uh, UK. Uh, but uh, remember that um, this when we talk about this ranking, this is for 2021. 2022 maybe something different. 2023 maybe something different. And I would say not maybe for sure to be different because fintech is a very, um, very uh, rapidly evolving market. And then uh, players, they are playing uh, very fast, um, uh, um, regulators, the ecosystems developing very fast. So today we are number one, but tomorrow we are, we don't know what will happen. So um, being in, the, reaching the top is one thing, but being in the top, keeping in the top, that's that's another, uh, another, another, another game. Uh, when it comes to the um, uh, the fintech hub or in OIC countries, Islamic uh, organi organization of Islamic cooperation countries, uh, Malaysia number one, uh, Malaysia the leader in that countries when it comes to the uh, growth of the Islamic fintech uh, in the market size, for example, uh, it is also number one when it comes to the ecos the conduciveness of the ecosystem for Islamic fintech as as well. Of course, there are uh, many countries. Uh, I would say they are close somehow, or they are growing. So, some for for example, uh, UAE, uh, they are growing and they have a good ecosystem uh, for Islamic fintech. Um, Indonesia, for example, uh, UK, they have uh, a lot of Islamic fintech startup. So they are growing very fast in the numbers of Islamic fintech. Uh, Indonesia have a big market for for Islamic fintech. Recently, last year, Saudi Arabia also was uh, growing very fast. They are not maturing it, but they are growing very fast um, uh, when, it, when it comes to the numbers. And that's uh, in the last few months, by the way, in, after, after this report has been published, in the last few months, a lot of Islamic printing in Saudi as well. Uh, uh, but they, they come to the market. So um, the, the global market, when you talk about regionally and globally for Islamic fintech, um, it's growing, it's growing uh, very fast. And the, being number one right now, uh, it's a responsibility for us to keep that one and actually to lead, uh, to lead uh, the the, uh, the innovation and uh, to lead the successful of the Islamic fintech journey. Islamic fintech journey. Now, um, how how we bring this in Malaysia? What what is the uh, ecosystem when we talk about the fintech ecosystem in Malaysia? Of course, when we talk about fin fintech ecosystem, that we have the regulatory frameworks, the government policies, um, Bank Negara Malaysia, Security Commission. We have My Digital. Uh, you have the supporting institutions and infrastructure, um, MDEC, for example, Mavcab, uh, Maranti, uh, the accelerator and accelerators, uh, digital labs. Uh, you see, like FWD, they're bringing one. Um, another, another uh, institutions also they bring the new innovation digital labs uh, for and accelerator programs for Islamic fintech um, in, in general, um, providing the capital through the government agencies or through the private sector, for example. Uh, the human capital development, another pillar when you talk about the fintech ecosystem in in general. So basically. In Malaysia, we have the, the key factors to, to establish an, an innovation fintech hub. Now, what is the focus of this innovation fintech hub? This is where we see Islamic fintech can be or should be the focus for innovation uh, fintech hub. Now, when it comes to when we talk about um, Islamic ecosystem or Islamic fintech ecosystem for, for Islamic fintech innovation ecosystem, um, First, we have the foundation for to have for have an innovation hub. We have the basic foundation from regulatory perspective, supporting institution, capital, human development. We have that one. Um, the other things, the other important thing that you have in Malaysia, actually, that uh, this is something that we need to capitalize on, that Malaysia is a leader, global leader, when it comes to the Islamic finance industry. Uh, this is 
uh, you see, for example, uh, based on quantitative development, the number, the uh, size, the assets of um, Islamic banks, of uh, Takafa companies, of the Islamic capital markets, the Sharia company and shares, uh, Sukuks and others. Um, also, a leader, global leader in Islamic finance, for example, when it comes to the governance, uh, the governance framework, for example, for Islamic finance is very robust in Malaysia. Uh, a global leader when it comes to the awareness in the market. So, for example, um, you go for other countries, you talk about uh, Islamic finance, you see a lot of people, they have no ideas what Islamic finance is about. But in Malaysia, the level of awareness of Islamic finance is high compared to other countries. So quantitative development, governance, awareness. Yes, Malaysia is a global leader in Islamic finance industry. Um, the other things, because here we are talking about innovation, right? And this is where uh, startups are trying to come up with an innovation, disruptive innovation to the market. So Malaysia also is a global leader in Islamic finance uh, research and development, R&D. And this is uh, based on the numbers of research paper uh, being published by um, academic institutions, uh, based uh, the number of academic institutions, they provide uh, programs in undergraduate, postgraduate level in Islamic finance, uh, the product innovation, the number of uh, conferences, seminars related to Islamic finance. So th this is a very important aspect that means uh, the R&D for Islamic finance is, is there. So you have you have now the basis for the fintech, you have the R&D for the Islamic finance, you are the leader for Islamic finance. And on top of these three things also, you have the potential growing market, first in the local market in Malaysia, second in the Asian market, and third in the global Islamic finance market. So looking at all these factors together, you see, can see like very clearly that Malaysia has a competitive advantage when it comes to the Islamic finance in terms of the industry, R&D, and marketing growth. Now, uh, we have this potential. Let's work on this. Let's build on that one. But of course, there are a lot of challenges there in the market. There are a lot of um, uh, obstacles that we may face. What are the obstacles that we may face, for example, as a fintech start, as a fintech, Islamic fintech startup in the market? Uh, last year, we have done an extensive research based on stakeholder Engage, in, engagement, uh, inter, interviews with the, uh, with the uh, Islamic fintech startups, with the Islamic fintech experts. And basically, they identify a few areas that, that are the challenges that we face as an Islamic fintech startups or as an Islamic fintech uh, experts or as, as a businessman that we want to establish Islamic fintech uh, companies. Uh, on top of those um, um, challenges, of course, uh, access to finance was, was one of the top of those challenges. Um, uh, so far, as, as, as a new startup, as a small startup, yes, uh, it may have the potential, uh, everything is there, but still it's very uh, hard to get uh, access to finance. Of course, uh, to talk to, to to, to get finance from the banks that just forget about it. Uh, but even though when you go for, for example, uh, VCs, you go to apply for grants, it's not easy to get uh, finance in general for the startup. Now, when it comes to the Islamic fintech, you may face another layer of difficulties. Uh, one difficulty that you may face uh, the question is why you want to focus just on Islamic finance, why you just make it in general for all, all the finance, and then you need to start to convince them why this is your targeted market and what is the potential for that mm -hmm. one. Um, on the other hand, of course, there are other difficulties that you may face. You may get the approval for the financing, but uh, the terms and conditions for that financing is not Sharia compliant. So you want to establish an Islamic fintech startup, you can get the financing, but it's not Sharia compliant. So. You, you face another another issue, another challenge to go to go to that one. And um, in, in most of the cases, because this um, it can be, for example, kind of a grant, for example, or other type of uh, financing, um, it's you are an, as an Islamic startup, you are not in um, a good position to negotiate that terms and conditions. Just sit there and you can just take it or, or leave it. 
Um, another issue is there, of course, the, um, um, the, the human capital. Um, when it comes to the Islamic fintech startup, you may need you may need a lot of a combination of skills and knowledge. You talk about um, uh, understanding, having the business acumen, understanding uh, the uh, landscape of of the fintech and of the business, uh, having uh, a Sharia knowledge about uh, what is permissible, what is not permissible, what is Sharia compliant, what's not Sharia compliant, uh, having the finance knowledge at the same time, having the uh, the uh, computer science or the IT knowledge because you are talking about the technology and fintech. So sometimes, or most of the time, having all this together, it's not easy to have and uh, uh, not easy also to build. So finding the right human capital for your startup is not, not an easy task when it comes to the Islamic finance, Islamic fintech. Now, um, especially when you know that the most of the uh, students graduating from the university, for example, they are either focusing on Islamic finance or entrepreneurship or the Sharia, for example. So they don't have this combination of all these uh, of all these um, uh, disciplines. Now, um, other other issues you face in the mar or, or the, the startup face in the market that. Um, the cost of being Islamic, sometimes you need to have, for example, Sharia auditor or uh, um, Sharia advisor. So you add a layer or additional cost for your uh, institution, for your small uh, institution, add additional cost for that one. Um, the awareness, that's uh, that's also an issue. The awareness, uh, that's an issue for fintech in general. And then when you come to Islamic fintechs, it's also you need to have uh, additional layer as well of complexity there. Um, 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 the uh, the uh, for the other the, this is in general sometimes there are specific problems for a specific kind of um, um, uh, for for the Islamic fintech for example when it comes to the CAFL, uh, the, the CAFL underwriting itself um, when it comes to the um, uh, uh, the social finance for example talk about wakaf and zakat uh, this is specific and unique for Islamic fintech. Uh, you have the issue, for example, of uh, trust and transparency and all on this kind of things. So there are there are actually like I would say a few issues or few challenges that uh, facing uh, Malaysia or facing the startup to expand and to 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 elaborate and to build and to grow in in Islamic uh, in Islamic fintech. Now. Um, how to come how how to work on on this on this challenges now what what we sh what we saw just right now those are actually um the the um the challenges or that the islamic fintech startup uh, feels or they perceive or they have look i have this challenge i don't have access to fund this is my challenge now when we look at it from macro level from ecosystem level it's we saw that it's not about that um, this is a specific challenge for um, a specific uh, a startup, for example, Islamic fintech startup, but it is more or a, a macro level issue that can be solved uh, differently. So we are not focusing on this issue itself, but we are focusing on the ecosystem itself, trying, trying to uh, bridge the gaps or fill the gaps in the ecosystem itself to solve this problems so yes we are number one in islamic fintech globally but we still if you go deeply and see look at the islamic fintech market islamic fintech startup in the in in, in the landscape we st we can see there are some i would say um some some big gaps there now look at the market the market the current market consists of a few we don't have many we have a few islamic fintech startup uh, most of them small and most of them in new Islamic fintech startups, right? This is this is the current situation right right, right now. So how we can go from this level of a uh, few small new startups to have many new, big and small and medium Islamic fintech startups. So grow, growing the ecosystem of of the Islamic fintech startup, not just. Uh, not just have not just being a niche, but to be a mainstream. How we can grow this uh, Islamic fintech startup from that second stage to the envisioned future stage for Islamic fintech uh, landscape. Um, you look at the market right now. You can see the market is fragmented. Yeah, there's uh, one Islamic fintech startup working on this side. There is one Islamic banks working in other side. Uh, most of them they are working in silos, right? 
um, uh, the uh, the level of collaboration in the market is not that uh, not there not there yet I, I would say it's not there yet you have the player you have the Islamic social finance players for example we talk about Zakat uh, work for institutions they are on one side and other side you have the fintech but startups but then the collaboration still in the very 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 beginning there so we're looking to change that to have more a conducive innovation ecosystem that's bringing these players together addressing what is the pain point of those players what is the pain point of the islamic social finance institutions for example uh, what is the pain point of the islamic banks or the careful companies that can be solved by the islamic fintech startup or that can be solved by the r d uh, from the from the academia um islamic fintech startup uh, they are very uh, agile, active. They can service. They can solve business problem, but they don't have a lot of time to spend it on the R and D. They don't have a lot of resources to spend of R and D. On the other side, we have academia, where we have a lot of people in an uh, in R and D, and they are willing to participate and to work on this. How we bring those people together? You have R and D people. You have Islamic fintech startup people, business people. Can you bring them together to solve a pain point that Islamic fintech industry uh, uh, feel and need, need 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 to be solved? Can you bring this together? So this is where we are right now, and this is we where we where we're trying to see how or where we can be in in a in a few few years. Um, so currently, with this fragmented uh, market, we see the, the the I would say it is a dearth of uh, a smart partnership between. Uh, those institution, financial institution, Islamic finance institution, uh, the, uh, social finance institution, startup and research institution, how we can build a meaningful, smart partnership between these institutions where they can work together to grow the Islamic fintech ecosystem in, in, in the country. Um, one of the observations as well that we see right now is the uh, moderate adoption of innovation in Islamic finance and in, in, in social finance as well. How we can be get more aggressive on this, how we can apply more advanced technology when it comes to the Islamic fintech and Islamic social finance. Uh, how we can uh, have a high, high value, the high value innovation, uh, where, how we can bring a disruption for the, for the market together. So what we are trying to see here is, as I mentioned in the beginning, yes, we are number one, but then how we keep there? We can, we can stay number one by keep leading the innovation, the disruption in the market, by growing up those small Islamic fintech startup to be leaders in local, regional, and on the global uh, Islamic fintech landscape, to grow them for, uh, for, for, other, uh, for other markets. Um, in in the region and also in in other in other regions, and all all these things it needs some kind of collaboration between all these all these all these parties to come together, to play together and to put together the strategy for that one. Now, in iConnect, we try to have this as as a vision, as uh, as I would say as a roadmap to work on to grow from what we have right now. To what we perceive to be in the future, um, the the stake I would say the stakeholders or the founding members coming from uh, from the fintech startup Islamic fintech startup in the market, from the regulators, from the mosti, um, uh, from the academia, from the civil from the civil society, coming together, building together, having this uh, right right vision together, and identify what are the areas that need to be enhanced. Now. Based on this, based on the current uh, situation that we have, of course, there are a lot of areas that we can be enhanced, but there are, uh, I would say, some focus area and some focus opportunities that we believe Islamic fintech startup need to look at it and try to emphasize on this, um, on this, uh, I would say, uh, uh, point. For example, Islamic social finance. Uh, we know that there is uh, there is like uh, I would say a clear obvious pain point when it comes to that transparency, the trust, the efficiency in dealing with the social finance fund, and this is an area 
uh, with that uh, we know that technology can solve a lot of this pain point, but then how to design this and implement this. So we believe that Islamic, Islamic fintech startup is an area where they can work, they can build solutions, implement solutions to help in that one. And on other side, for example, we have uh, the, um, uh, the, I would say, the Sharia compliant decision making in Islamic finance, being in Islamic banks, being in the Kafal or Islamic capital market. The process of the Sharia compliant decision making. Can we automate it? Can we use advanced technology to go for that one? Uh, we have the um, data data analytics, for for example. Uh, can how we can use data analytics when it comes to the Islamic social finance? How we can use advanced data analytics when when it goes to the Islamic social finance? Um, some ideas to implement, for example, machine learning, artificial intelligence. How we can implement this this area? How we can grow our Islamic fintech startups to go for to collaborate together and go for that area. We believe that, or we see that there are a lot of uh, uh, pain points here and there. And how it can be solved, it cannot be solved solely by one, one company, but it can be solved by collaboration, bring together the institutions, bring together the startup, bring together the researchers, the academia, and each one of them try to solve part of the puzzle, to put, to, to put it together to have to come up with the envisioned future Islamic fintech landscape. Um, um, in my intention, I, I want to give some examples for uh, successful uh, Islamic fintech startups. But then I felt that uh, it is not about which company is the successful one, but it's about where the whole ecosystem is uh, successful or not. So as, that's why I prefer to give the examples of the areas that I believe this is that has, has high potential for the Islamic fintech startup to work on on one side, and also for the Islamic fintech experts, the researchers to work on other side. Okay, so that's all from my side, and thank you very much. We can open it for the Q and A. Thank you so much, Dr. Kinan, for the presentation. So we have a couple of questions from the floor. Um, we have a question here from Marcus. Um, hi, Doctor. In your opinion, how has the Islamic fintech scene in Malaysia changed in the past decade? And what will be the future landscape for Islamic fintech look like? Okay. Um, if, if you look at like a few years back when it comes, let's say 10, 10 years back. 10 years back, nobody will, uh, will say Islamic fintech. You will, you will never talk about Islamic fintech. And uh, also 10 years back, when you, when you say fintech, even Sharia compliant fintech is not there. Because the idea here is that technology is neutral. It is not to, about Sharia compliant or non-Sharia compliant. But then in the last few years, this has been changed somehow. When we see that technology is neutral, but then how you implement and how you apply the technology to solve the pain point of the Islamic finance. And then we start to see some startups coming in the market, solving these problems. Now, the first, and what was very obvious thing that um, when it comes, for example, to lending, because this is lending, there's an interest, there's a riba there. So this is a very clear point where Islamic fintech can be there. And this is where you, you can see um, Islamic fintech crowdfunding platform, for example, uh, Islamic fintech uh, P2P uh, platform, for example. So this is the beginning of the Islamic fintech. Now, those companies, they are there, but they are, as I mentioned, they are still small companies. We need to grow them in the numbers, in the size, in the market, and all these things. But in the last one or two years, we see, I would say, I can see a new wave for Islamic fintech, which is not focusing on, like, for example, on the crowdfunding or lending or those kind of things, but it focuses more on the process itself. Like, as I mentioned, um, the, uh, the decision-making Sharia compliant process, how this process is coming in and how we can provide fintech solution to, uh, to, to, to solve or to enhance this process. Uh, um, uh, using alternative data, right? Uh, being financial data, psychometric data, transaction data, social media data, how we can build an Islamic fintech application to use this data. So I see now kind of a new wave for the Islamic fintech company coming in, focusing more on the technology and the process. 
All right. Thank you so much for the answer, Dr. Kinan. I think we also have a couple of questions uh, regarding the same topic um, by Akmal and Chris. So um, what um, do you think it would be more challenging for non-Muslims to venture into the Islamic fintech market? And if so, uh, what are the biggest challenges and barriers to entry into the Islamic finance industry for non for non-Muslim entrepreneurs? Okay, so basically, if I'm not mistaken, the the fintech, almost all the Islamic fintech company that I see, I see the staff are mixed Muslim and non-Muslims. I think that, that that's for all. So it actually, it really doesn't matter that if, for example, the founder of the C or the CEO is Muslim or non-Muslim, because in the end of the day, this is the whole company is working together. And the current company that I see, all of them, they are mixed. So there, I, I cannot see any uh, barrier for for the for the non-Muslim entrepreneur to go for for the Islamic fintech. Of course, for non-Muslim entrepreneur, he, if he doesn't have, for example, an Islamic finance background. So he may lack some uh, information or, or knowledge about the, the Islamic finance, for example, or the Islamic fintech or the Sharia compliant part. And this is, can be complemented by the stuff that they have this kind of knowledge and this kind of experience. So I, I don't see this as, as an obstacle at all. Thank you so much, Dr. Kinan. We have one final question here from TK. Uh, some say that fintech is only largely concentrated in places like the Klang Valley area or more developed areas. So in your opinion, how does fintech influence the lower level markets across Malaysia? Okay, so basically, I, I, I believe the concentration is because this is where you want uh, the resources, right? So even like, for example, you are living in under, another state, or another city, uh, but you look for the resources, you need your stuff. So this is where the stuff is there. You need to get fund. This is where the fund is there. You need the support the, from the regulators, other agency. They are all, all there, right? In the Kelang Valley. So that's why all of the FinTech, they will focus, we will establish and focus on the Kelang Valley. Now, the, the opportunity there is actually that um, this area, you can see it's almost, so somehow it is all, all the focus is on this area right and when you want to is when you want to focus the the big market for the m bank for the non bank for uh, marginalized people they are not in this area right and this is where you can actually this is an opportunity to serve this market in other areas so you can establish there but your market actually in in the other in the other areas Sim similar to where that like, um, you have your headquarter here, but your main market may be Indonesia or your main market is in other countries. Um, uh, for, for example, uh, even like in other countries in the GCC, you may have headquarter in UAE, but then you're all, you, all of your operation in Pakistan, for example, right? So for Islamic fintech, it's the same. You can have your, in, in Kuala Lumpur, for example, your headquarter, your stuff, but then your market is in another state, in the rural area and in other areas. Thank you, Dr. Kinan. Um, one last question here by Hashim. Uh, Dr. Kinan, just to have your opinion, is it illegal or unlawful for a Muslim to transact in conventional or standard fintech? Okay, good question. So this is depend on this transaction. What is the transaction that you are doing, right? Like for example, even for, let, let's take an example of conventional bank. In conventional bank, if you are taking a loan, conventional loan, right? So this is not permissible from Sharia perspective. But if you are transferring money from account to account, so that's fine. So it's depend on the transaction that you are you are doing and you are involving in. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kinan. I believe uh, these are all the questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kinan, for joining us today. I believe that all participants have uh, benefited greatly from today's session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. All right. Uh, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce all of you to our second speaker, uh, Nuro Alpha, who is the Senior Executive of Shara Advisory at Masriyaf Advisory. 
So um, Mastery of Advisory uh, is a boutique advisory firm that focuses on Shara advisory and Islamic product development. Mastery of is run by ex-senior bankers who used to serve the ASEAN and Middle East region. Mastery of draws from the in-depth banking experience by its principals and consultants in both Islamic and conventional finance. Uh, Alpha, you may take the stage. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so to add in, hi, uh, I'm Alpha from Marshall Advisory. So to add in to Wayne's introduction uh, earlier, at Marshall Advisory, we do product structuring, product development for uh, Sharia compliant products, right? And we focus more on um, fintech uh, or startups companies who wants to do like financing products or uh, yeah, basically any fintech related products that you want to, to convert to Islamic, we can do that for you. So um, to start my uh, session, let me just share my screen. All right. So uh, the, the, our topic today is uh, disruptive opportunities in the Indonesian market, right? And focusing more on Islamic fintech. As we have heard earlier from Dr. Kinan, uh, very interestingly that Dr. Kinan has presented to us a uh, few data on uh, how uh, Islamic, our Islamic fintech uh, environment currently is, and Malaysia is currently the number one um, in uh, the global uh, as a global hub for Islamic fintech, right? Uh, so to start my session, I would like to uh, start with describing what is Islamic fintech first. So uh, as uh, Dr. Kinan earlier mentioned, I'm very interested in what Dr. Kinan said, right? That like the technology itself, people always think that technology is like a, a, a neutral subject, right? It doesn't need to be shy or compliant. But what does uh, from where this uh, Islamic fintech comes from. So Islamic fintech, uh, from uh, what I can uh, conclude, right, from uh, this is my personal definition of when people ask what Islamic fintech, I will say that it is a combination of like financial services with uh, Sharia compliant elements and enabled by technology. So think of it like a, a traditional way of raising funds or uh, taking deposit and uh, deposit and lending like like the banking sectors, right? A um, few years back, you will have to do your deposit and withdrawal over the counter. You'll have to go like physically to the bank. So, but nowadays we can only do that uh, over our internet banking and so on. We even have um, we we. We even will have uh, more digital digital banks coming coming up coming on in the future, right? So uh, the traditional way of raising funds, they they uh, the way they work like they take deposit from the public and then they lend it to the public, right? So they might be some uh, there are some underserved segment within that industry. That's where alternative finances comes. So when alternative finance come, um, when alternative finance come, there is, uh, so sorry. So uh, go back to the banking sectors, right? We have the conventional uh, banks, and we also have the Islamic banks. So when the alternative finance comes, um, we need to have products which are also uh, Sharia compliant that follows the the uh, Islamic rules that is guided by uh, the Quran and Asuna, which is the main uh, guidance in uh, Islam. So uh, this is where uh, Islamic finance or Sharia compliant financing comes in. It is in the structuring of the product and not the technology itself. I would say that the technology, uh, Islamic fintech in its name, the technology is like an enabler. Uh, the main concern is uh, on the product structuring, on the operation side of the product itself. So um, I have prepared this slide, but unfortunately, uh, no, like not unfortunately. Fortunately, Dr. Kinan has has uh, covered all of this. This is a report from uh, Islamic Global Islamic FinTech 
um, Global Islamic Fintech Report, right? From um, OIC, if I'm not mistaken. So if we can see here, Malaysia is the number one um, uh, country dominating the Islamic fintech market. However, we can we can still see that uh, there is still a gap in even even though like Dr. Kina mentioned, we, even though we are the number one now, there are still gap that can be filled by new startups, new fintech companies. So uh, these are the these are the uh, seg segments. If you can see here, these are the segments where uh, Islamic fintechs uh, has stepped in alternative finances, capital market, digital asset, uh, deposit and lending. This is where P2P comes in, ECL comes in, the wealth management like Wahid Invest and uh, Hello Gold, some of uh, which I can mention. The insurance, we, we now have Taka Tech, uh, InsurTech, right? Social finance, we can, Islamic finance can basically tap into any uh, segment of the of the financing, right? That's that's how wide Islamic finance is. <clears throat> so uh, coming to what Mashrif is doing, so we want to talk about product structuring, right? There are some aspects that we need to look at when we do when we say we want to structure a product as a Sharia compliant. So the first one that we look at, what is it? What is it? Uh, it is the type of business that the company is running. So if the underlying business is already Sharia compliant, we can see that uh, we can easily say that the business can be transferred, the, the product can be transferred into a Sharia compliant one. And the second one is the, the revenue stream, is the money flows. Um, we always look at how the money, uh, how the the money flows, so that there is no money that is taken unlawfully that is not within the what Sharia allows. The third one is the process flow, that is basically where we structure the product end to end. And also when we talk about uh, fintech products, right, we'll have to look at at, at the back end system as well, not only how. Um, customer sees it, but how the companies operates as well. And uh, the fourth one is the legal documentation. And the legal documentation is very important as it will be the main uh, agreement between parties, right? So the essence of Islamic finance is when you do uh, contracts, it has to be, it has to be uh, agreed between all the parties that is involved. So and the last one is how you utilize the income. So let's say you uh, raise the fund for, you raise the fund for, uh, let's say you raise the fund for something, for something that is Sharia compliant, back to the first one, the type of business, right? The, 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 the um, how you utilize the income will be scrutinized as well. So you have to utilize the income only to Sharia compliant, um, matters only. So how you raise the fund, that should be Sharia compliant and how you use it, that is also need to be Sharia compliant. So what we can see here, we have to look, we'll have to look like end to end to make sure that it is a Sharia compliant product that comes at the end of the process. And the last one I would love to touch about uh, the regulatory development, right? Because when we see uh, at first, when fintech emerge, there is not much uh, regulatory aspects that comes in. There's even lots of papers that mention that uh, this fintech is not viable, as regulators themselves cannot regulate them, right? So um, when BNM and Securities, uh, Securities Commission of Malaysia started to regulate them, we can see the environment getting uh, more traction, getting uh, clearer getting more organized. So it starts with um, the, the guideline on e-money that is back in 2008, is that early as when the Bitcoin emerged. So um, after that, it comes, uh, it comes like, like a quite a rapid um, regulatory, regulatory changes, I would say, from BNM, comes from, uh, they, they want to regulate digital currencies 
and then the uh, electronic trading platform, and then comes the EKYC, and then the, the latest one is the digital banks, which is expected to uh, the, the digital, which is expected to be announced like uh, quart first quarter of this year, right? So, and the latest one is the digital insurance and takaful operators, which is a discussion paper. So, um, back then, I remember two years back, uh, when we talk about um, insure tech or taka tech, people were saying it was not, uh, it was not viable, right? So, the, how the takaful industry or the insurance industry cannot be di digitalized, they say. But now it was, uh, it was getting clearer to us that technology can come in. It can come in in the, uh, like the, from the underwriting, doing the underwriting policies and then uh, until the, how we claim our insurance, right? So uh, just imagine how, how uh, smooth the process will be if uh, this digital insurer and takaful operators can be realized soon. So from SC side, they have uh, guidelines on recognized market operators, the RMO, which is uh, the guidelines that operate most uh, fintech startups, such as P2P, ECF, the DEX, digital asset exchange, uh, the crypto, uh, not the crypto, because the digital asset exchange, the IEO, uh, and so on. And then they have the digital asset guidelines. They also have the uh, digital currency and digital token guideline under the CMSA. And uh, not forgetting when we talk about Islamic uh, fintech, when we talk about Sharia matters, we in Malaysia, we are lucky to always have a Sharia Advisory Council of BNM and also Securities Commission of Malaysia that will uh, guide us on how to make things Sharia compliant. So there are guidelines, uh, there are like, we call it resolutions from Sharia Advisory Council of uh, Securities Commission on how digital asset can be Sharia compliant. How can we categorize digital asset? Does it need to be Sharia compliant or it doesn't to be Sharia compliant? And also the last one that I listed here is Sharia screening methodology for MSME. This is not uh, really like a fintech, uh, focusing on fintech, this Sharia screening methodology. It's like this Sharia screening methodology for the listed companies, the one that Bursa use. But this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, right, the, the Islamic, the fintech uh, segment is focusing more on the underserved and the SMEs. So uh, the Sharia screening methodology for unlisted M MSMEs would more likely to be used by uh, by the fintech, the Islamic fintech uh, operators. And for uh, the last one, this is the list of Islamic fintech uh, players that is currently operating in our in our environment in Malaysia. I might have missed uh, some of the some of the players. But uh, I just want to show some of them because in, in P2P, we have Microlip, we have Cap Bay, we have Panisip. They have been operating, Microlip is the first one to be Islamic. So they've been operating around uh, two, three years in the market. And we have uh, also ATIS, it was not long known. Um, and we also have the BNPL, BNPL, which is uh, like a new topic, which uh, people are still arguing whether they, they, need, they need to be Sharia compliant or it need not. So we we, all, we already have in the market uh, two BN, Sharia compliant BNPL, which is Split and IRP. Um, we also have the digital wealth management, Wahid Invest. Wahid Invest uh, is like a investment, uh, they, uh, they call themselves Rovo Advisor. So you can invest in their, in their uh, platform, right? And generate return from from that. Uh, we also have Alusra. Alusra is a wheel writing, digital wheel writing uh, platform. So you can do your wheel writing and you, they, you'll just, um, you'll just uh, well, key in your, how much uh, assets you have and they'll calculate it according to the Islamic uh, Faraid, Faraid calculation, like the Islamic law of 
um, for inheritance. And we also have visual. It's kind of a uh, Takatek in the Takatek segment. Uh, we also have the FX and financing, which is a supply chain financing platform. And the and uh, the last column, uh, I put their commodity trading platform. But I would say that the commodity trading platform is kind of like uh, I think it is. Uh, I think it suits to. Uh, it is eligible to say that uh, they are part of Islamic fintech uh, segment, right? But uh, they kind of like enabler for us to do commodity trading, for us to do like uh, commodity murabaha and by Adem Biasila or some of them. So uh, I think that is all for me. Maybe you can open the floor for any question if there's any. All right, thank you so much for the presentation, Alpha. I think we have a couple of questions here. Um, let's start off with a question from TK. Um, so TK asks, Islamic fintech and Shara compliance go hand in hand, but the concept of it is still shrouded with mystery for some people who are still new in this venture. What are some of Masriyev's initiatives in dis demystifying the concept of Shara compliance to educate the general public? So, um, if I understand the, the question correctly, right? So, as I mentioned, Islamic fintech, uh, some people are saying that it does not need to be Sharia compliant, but it all uh, lies in the structure itself. So, like uh, what Islamic banks are doing, they have the conventional products and they also have the Islamic products, right? So, how Islamic products uh, operate is different, is totally different from the what, uh, from what conventional product is. So we'll have to look at the product structuring, we'll have to look at the uh, money flows, we'll have to look at the accounting entries, we'll have to look at the operations, the SOPs and everything. So um, what Marshif is currently doing is that first, we are doing the product structuring, right? So we make sure that all uh, products are in compliance with Sharia laws and then we doesn't stop here because Islamic fintech is new, right? So some of the uh, players, they, we we did not have like a clear guideline on how Islamic fintech Islamic fintech products should operate. So after we do product structuring, we'll be doing a Sharia review as well. There will be that will be like an an annual Sharia review, like a quarter Sharia review, to make sure that all operations are in line with Sharia. So yeah, I hope I answers that. Uh, question. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Alpha. Uh, next question here from Jasmine. Um, with Islamic fintech and Shara compliance being the buzzword nowadays, it is definitely something that uh, people are starting to venture into. Could you suggest some key processes or key resources that early startups could refer to in order to create Shara compliant products and services? Uh, definitely, you can come to us. In the first, uh, we, we can guide you to uh, what kind of uh, elements that you need to look at uh, to structure a, an Islamic product, right? The other sources that uh, you can uh, look at to, uh, you can refer to, I think the, I think referring to some of the resolution would be all right because uh, the resolution does not really it's structured in a way that the public can understand it. So when you are like a, uh, you, you are with, if you are with a non-Islamic finance, even if you are not with Islamic finance background, you can still understand what the resolution says. So this, the resolution would, um, would clarify what are the issues and then what, uh, yeah, basically what are the things that you, need to look at uh, to make uh, the, the product. What makes uh, the Sharia resolution says that the product is Sharia compliant. So that's uh, number two. I think, um, yeah, some of the key processes, I think the easiest way you can look at is the your business, your uh, underlying business. <clears throat> so let's say, if your underlying business is already Sharia compliant, so if it's not pork, if it's not alcohol, if it doesn't have anything to do with gambling, you can uh, 
you can you can have ease of mind and start to uh, explore more whether the product can be shown or compared or not. So uh, definitely there will be other things that other things other some uh, complicated things I would say that we need to look at while doing the product searching, right? But uh, the basic things I would say that one lah, the business activities. All right, I hope that answers your question. Um, before I move on to Lynn, um, Jasmine also had like an additional question on top of a question. So she would just like to understand what are the repercussions of not abiding by the guidelines? Because um, as someone who is not well versed in Sharia, do you think it's important for her to have the necessary knowledge and insights into Sharia law and regulations in order to come up with an Islamic fintech startup? Or would it be sufficient to have a Sharia advisor on board instead? I think it is, uh, I think you can always outsource things, but uh, during the process, so we have, we have, um, yeah, like, like uh, previously, uh, I saw one people ask the Kinan, right? If uh, it is okay for a non Muslim to venture into Islamic fintech. So, do you, in the early stage, you might not be familiar with the Islamic concepts, right? But along the way, you'll start to learn, um, you'll start to understand how Islamic concept work, how Islamic process should work. So, um, as someone who is not well versed, uh, if you are a Muslim, it is, it is uh, necessary for you to be well versed in Sharia. But that one you can learn over time, right? So if you are a non-Muslim trying to venture into Islamic fintech, that one, uh, that one will be you can catch catch it up over time. So uh, the other question that what are the repercussions of not abiding by the guidelines? Uh, so from a regulatory aspect, I would say. Uh, First, if, if we go to like the legal aspect, right? If you go to court, you will definitely don't, uh, you might you might lose your income. So that's, yeah. So uh, if if the if the product is structured using Sharia of compliant um, concept, but at the end, the operation is not Sharia of compliant, the first thing is you would, look, you, you would lose your income. You can earn the income that you, um, have already generated from the business, right? So, it, uh, Jasmine, I hope that answers the question. Yep, okay. So, the next question is from Erin. Um, she's asking, what are some of the most common difficulties faced by startups when navigating Sharia compliance? Um, some of the most difficulties. Hmm. The first, I think the challenges are in understanding how Sharia compliant works. So, because Sharia compliant, like I said, can be learned all the time, but it is a, it is a sensitive subject. It is a, a like a, it a deep depth understanding, like a depth knowledge. So, um, that one, that is one, understanding how Sharia compliant works. And then structuring uh, the the legal documents, right? We have to be really, we have to really scrutinize the document so that there is no clauses or that there is no um, gap that can make the product non sharia compliant. So uh, at Marshall, we are trained to look at every single thing, even the smallest thing that you didn't think it is it matters to Sharia. We will always look at it. So it's not only uh, it's not only the Sharia compliant methods. We only we also look at the process, the system. If there's uh, any system related uh, clauses in the agreement, we also look at it at, look at them. So yeah, for for the startups, um, I think that for the startups, it's how uh, they want to structure restructure the 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 product, the current product that they have to a Sharia compliant one. So if it's uh if it's the financing product, you can easily convert it. But if it if it uh the product has some 
syariah non-compliant elements, you'll have to change that so that will uh, also affect the operations of the startup, right? Right, yeah, I hope that um, answers your question, Erin. Um, the next question we have is from Baizura. You mentioned of contradicting views on BNPL. What is Masriya's opinion on BNPL and how do you convince the others who has different opinion? Mm. So at Mashref, we believe that the NPL, um, we look at the NPL as kind of because uh, be, how the NPL works is that you go to certain, uh, what we call it, certain merchants, and then the, the customer, uh, the customer will be able to check out using that merchant, like using speed, right? So they kind of give you loan to buy the to buy the goods that you want, the goods that you want. So, um, we look at the MPL as one of the segments that need to be short or compliant. So what we look at at the MPL is um, what kind of merchant, what kind of merchant they are hosting. So if the merchant are short or compliant, that will be all right. So what are the charges that they charge? So when you do a loan, when you give uh when you give out loan basically in islam it is not uh, allowable for you to claim like extra if you give 100 you have to you you get back 100 you cannot get 101 back that will be uh considered as interest okay um yeah so next is uh from katie are we able to approach, approach Masriya to understand Sharia compliant process for certain fintech related products? Yes, you uh, you can reach out to us or uh, to me. Um, I, I'll drop my email. I'll drop uh, our company's email as well uh, for if if you want to uh, get in touch. All right, cool. Our last question, I believe, from Chris. At what stage of the startup do you recommend starting a Sharia? <laughs> Um, I think if you want to start at uh, early stage of the startup, that will also be possible. But that will depends on your uh, how you how you wish your startup to be, like in which direction you are going through. If you want to, if you want it to be like fully share compliant, we would we would uh, we would definitely advise for it to start in the earliest stage because if you start in the earliest stage, it will be lesser. Uh, changes that you need to make for it to be share or compliant to convert it from a conventional one to share or compliant ones, right? So to to answer that in a nutshell, uh, at what stage I cannot answer that. That is definitely uh, it, it will goes back to how your company's how your company direction wish to be in which direction do you want it to be like a fully share or compliance or how how do you plan the how do you plan the business? But we'll we'll always be um, ready to to advise at whatever stage uh, you you have. All right. Hope that answers your question. There's a question from Mr. Allen. Is Kagama Sharia and compliant? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm afraid. There's uh. So so one thing about uh being a Sharia consultant, right? People always ask if things are Sharia compliant, but I'm afraid I cannot answer. It's not uh, being a, like labeling things Sharia compliant or not. It's not like a simple thing, right? We'll have to look at uh what is the what is the un, like the underlying uh things that. I mentioned earlier, like all the documents. So as for Chagamas personally, I haven't seen their like their documentation. I haven't scrutinized any of their uh, processes. So uh, Mr. Alan, I'm really sorry. I'm afraid I cannot answer that. Okay, yeah. So um, I believe that Nisa has dropped the email for you to get in contact with um, Masriyaf. So if you have any more further inquiries, you can just um, email them at info at masjf.com. All right, over to you, Wayne. All right, uh, thank you so much, Safa, and thank you, uh, Alpha, as well, for answering all the questions. If any of you have any further questions for Alpha or Masjf, uh, as mentioned by Safa just now, you may uh, reach out to them via the email in the chat box. Thank you. 
Okay, so right now, um, we are down to our final speaker, um, Encik uh, Zarin. Uh, I hope Encik Zarin is in the call already. Um, hi, Rin. Hi, Encik Zarin. Yes, I am in the call. All right. Yes. Uh, welcome, Encik Zarin. Um, before, um, before you begin, uh, let me just uh, give you a brief introduction on Encik Zarin. So Encik Zarin is the Head of Commercial uh, Center of Digital Experience and Bank Islam. Uh, Anjik Zarin advocates the crusade for financial inclusion and helping people lead healthy financial lives. Presently, he is overseeing digital products and propositions for Bank Islam and is a founding member of the Center of Digital Experience at Bank Islam. Anjik Zarin is an alumni of Coventry University in the field of computer science and he kick-started his career as a developer before moving on to business development and consultancy roles in leading technology firms. At Bank Islam, he has spearheaded the Digital Transformation Plan, oversee the Digital Banking Strategy and Roadmap, and is a subject matter expert for digital innovation and initiatives across the organization. Outside of Bank Islam, Zarin unleashes pent-up energy on golf, scuba diving, and is a self-confessed adrenaline junkie. Uh, on to you, Encik Zarin. Thank you very much, uh, Wayne. Uh, Salam wa rahmatullahi wa uh, Very good afternoon, everyone. So let me just share my screen uh, and uh, let's see if everybody can see my screen. Okay, do let me know once you're able to see it. Yes, we can see your screen now. Oh, okay, great. Alhamdulillah. All right, so I would like to take this opportunity uh, to wish everyone here Kongsi uh, Fachai. I would like to express my gratitude to FWD Startup Studio. Congratulations. Uh, along with Lead Ventures, M. Dak Maranti, and all of you today uh, to be here with me uh, to talk about Islamic FinTech and the opportunities that it presents itself within the Malaysian market. All right. Uh, are we moving to the next slide? Yes. All right. Okay, great. Okay, so I will not deep dive on Islamic fintech, the definition of Islamic fintech, as our colleague from Ashraf, Ms. Nur Alpha, has elaborated uh, quite uh, comprehensively. But I want to talk about uh, the opportunity that Islamic fintech do bring uh, to close the gap of uh, financial inclusion right where we are leveraging that use of technology to uphold uh, vbi that's something that uh, within malaysia uh, within the uh, islamic finance practice that that we are upholding the value based intermediation which we aim to deliver the intended outcomes of sharia through practice conduct and offerings right and also to generate that positive and sustainable impact to the economy community environment so that's that's key right really it is uh, outcome driven Right. So when we are discussing about financial inclusion, uh, I think first and foremost, we need to understand what causes uh, financial exclusions. You know, how are they society and individuals that have been left out of the mainstream financial systems? Right. And uh, we in general, we believe that there are four general causes of financial exclusions and uh, understanding these problem statements, only then one can start to develop uh, any solution, right, be it Islamic fintech or what not, right? So the first one that we believe is is really about uh, the, the the low income, right? It is widely believed that low income is directly related to those people who are completely financially excluded, right? So these are people who are on benefits, who has uh, paid uh, cash in hand jobs, right? And sometimes they are single parents and those with disability, you know, they often find themselves in the low income bracket and hence why they are excluded. The reason is because that... Uh, well, I will, I will be very candid about this. It makes them less de desirable to mainstream banking, right? Uh, so it really becomes virtually impossible for, for them to gain access to financial products, right? Then the next one, the next cause is social exclusion, right? So these are the un unemployed, the financially dependent on another person or, or those who, had, who does not have any credit history. Uh, we, we term them as thin file, right? Uh, so, so the mainstream banks, disregard them as being credit worthy because they, they can't assess their credit worthiness, right? And sometimes they they could be someone new to the country where they do not, they do not have any credit history in, in the new country that they're residing. Hence, they are becoming financially excluded, right? Then uh, the third cause would be product suitability, 
right? So the lack of financial services uh, for people who do not fit a mainstream financial profile, uh, as I mentioned, there are two just now, the low income social exclusion, but there, there could be other uh, other profiles as well that, that may not really fit the product suitability. For example, the first jobbers or the job seekers, right? So hence creating a lack of insurance credit and day-to-day -day banking facilities uh, to those uh, to those um, uh, segmentation, right? Okay, and finally is digital gap, right? Uh, and now now we see that uh, you, especially with with COVID, it has kind of accelerated that digitalization uh, within uh, the financial industry, and it has speeded up and widened the digital gap, right? Because now not not many has an IT presence and, you know, uh, do not understand how to access uh, finance online, such as online banking, right? So these are the four causes uh, that, that even for us, uh, Bank Islam, we're cognizant of in actually developing our social finance and uh, digital banking uh, solutions, right? So next, I'll go to the challenges within uh, Islamic fintech, right? So Islamic fintech has seen challenges when, when compared to traditional banking practice. Right. Uh, so we, we do see that from, from the consumer perspective, it's sometimes maybe lack of Islamic finance education. And some that's that's one thing that uh, that uh, really, yes, it is perceived that uh, the, the literacy is high, higher than other countries. Uh, but but still uh, a lot of uh, Muslim wouldn't know how to differentiate what are the difference between uh, conventional and Islamic products, right? And as, of course, the competition from conventional products. And for Islamic fintech providers, uh, I think uh, Dr. Kinan did touch a bit uh, in terms of lack of funding opportunities and lack of uh, talents uh, that is available uh, to to uh, Islamic fintech providers, right? Okay, I will not go deep dive again uh, on this. Uh, again, this comes from the GIF report, uh, something that Dr. Kinan did touch, something that uh, uh, Ms. Nurul Alpha also did kind of touch. But I, I, I want to point out that in Malaysia, we are in that prime position actually to be a leader uh, within Islamic fintech, right? Due to we are a leader of the Islamic finance market itself, right? We have a lot of thought leadership. Uh, I mean, this is uh, exemplified by organizations like uh, Bank Islam, organizations like Mashref, who are uh, who are uh, visible uh, globally, right? Okay, but I would like to zoom in to the opportunities of of Islamic fintech, right? So when we look at the customers, who are the customers, right? We we don't necessarily just look into the consumers per se. Uh, there are a lot more uh, market uh, within the business and organizations. For example, the P2P lending, the capital market. We Financial institutions like Bank Islam ourselves, we could also be the customers of, of FinTech and uh, our, our couple of slides down, I will kind of explain, you know, how we are ourselves uh, uh, customers or consumers of uh, Islamic fintech, right? But when we look at Islamic fintech, uh, we look at the hierarchy of financial needs, right? Uh, and and what we are trying to bridge is financial inclusion. We are trying to bridge uh, better wealth distribution, right? So hence, we're looking at in terms of uh, social finance, right? Uh, that is an area where, where Islamic fintech can really come in by enabling technologies, for example, data being accessible anywhere. So those were the the key uh, mechanisms that were missing before for, for us to actually uh, provide a good uh, social finance uh, within the industry. Uh, it goes into Takaful as well and uh, where, where, you know, protection previously, financial protection previously is kind of like a very, very big ticket item. Uh, the premiums were a bit high, but with the advance of, uh, the advance of technology, they are able to fractionalize uh, the premiums, uh, make it more bite-sized, right? So these are the areas where, you know, it's really about making the products that 
are already there but more accessible uh, uh, to the to the to the segmentations that I've mentioned before within the financial exclusion, right? So that goes also for safe and invest, right? When we look at investment previously, you know, when you look at equity investment, stock trading, it's all very, very big ticket. Uh, it is not fractionalized. Hence, the barrier to entry is, is very, very high for those who are financially excluded and hence why they are financially excluded. Yeah, all right. So that also goes into uh, lending and financing, right? Uh, when we look at the, the financially excluded, they are not those who traditionally have those data points that will be accepted by the mainstream banks, right? Uh, as I mentioned, the cash uh, by day sort of jobs, right? The gig workers, they would not have that steady stream of uh, I wouldn't say steady, I would say it's steady, but I would say they will not have that consistency, right, in terms of being paid on the same day every month and having an employer vouching that, yes, you know, this person is working here and will be working here for a number of years to come, right? So this is where we need to look at alternative data points. How do we assess them uh, that they are credit worthy, you know, that they are willing to actually back their financing right okay uh moving on uh i'm just going to talk a bit about uh the initiatives within uh, bank islam so when we talk about financial inclusion we have our own crowdfunding uh, which we have launched uh back in 2018 itself right sedekah house where we attempt to uh, better manage um uh, saraka and uh, better identifying uh, the change makers within the country and ensuring that they have access to fund, right? For example, the IGN Foundation, right? And recently, uh, during uh, during the pandemic, we have introduced um, new products, for example, Itacad, Bankit Microfinance, and Umbi, which really use uh, the Sirka Fund to provide financing, right? And we have also introduced Magma My Wakaf Fund, where you actually are investing uh, in a unit trust, but certain returns will be, uh, the proceeds will go to Wakaf, right? And we're really trying to digitalize everything to ensure that uh, we're able to uh, expand uh, or deepen the financial inclusion. For example, we have our mobile app with Go, we're now introducing, we have introduced Go based and SME expert uh, to give our uh, SME and commercial customers uh, access to uh, digital banking. I myself, I'm part of the Center of Digital Experience where we're working on a digital bank proposition. Inshallah, we should be able to launch uh, within, within this couple of weeks. And uh, actually, we also have our own robo-advisor within the stables. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, it is something that is known within the market. Uh, by our subsidiary BNB Invest, right? So BNB Investment has its best app and it's a robo advisor, uh, which you can start uh, investing uh, within uh, 10 ringgit, right? Okay, so these are, actually we have established a lot of partnerships or some of them are still uh, towards the tail end of being penned, hence why uh, I am not at liberty to actually share it within uh, this, this forum. But uh, I'll share, for example, uh, the uh, example of people pay, right? So we first started out uh, the problem statement of cashless university back in 2017-2018, right? And uh, we were ideating and trying to solutionize how are we able to get universities uh, to be cashless and then take it to the next step, which is going to be cardless, right? So one of the solution that came out was actually having an e-wallet but we we thought that you know having a bank uh, having an e-money license you know it is it does not really it does not really jive it's kind of like reinventing back uh, the whole wheel right so we thought of why not let us uh, partner right with a fintech and and we got to know about Kipple Pay and Kipple Pay is also active within the uh, 
universities, right? And we decided this was a good uh, win-win situation where we could launch Kipal Uni together uh, to really empower cashless and cutless communities within the, the bank and providing uh, the merchants within uh, the universities with low MDR going try, uh, through, through the e-wallet, acquired by uh, the e-wallets, right? Then we have another partnership that we have inked right and we are still working together to come up with the solution it's actually with use pod right so pod is that financial well-being platform for public to save and consume financial products right so pod has been working uh, closely with a lot of uh, gig platform providers right to uh, provide some sort of savings uh, for for the gig workers right and what we're trying to do now is to further get the gig workers financially included where we are working with pot to understand the financial behaviors uh, of the pot savers, right? Especially the gig workers and to introduce a financing product for these particular pot customers, creating that new alternative scorecard that we're able to assess the credit worthiness uh, of, of uh, the customers, right? Okay. And um, those were examples of uh, opportunities that we were looking out for but for 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 the sake of this forum uh, there are three big key areas that that we are still actively pursuing for partnerships right so the first one is fi financial literacy right so we are looking for partners or fintech providers who are able to provide financial literacy and management or co-create with us uh, who is able to who has a solution in terms of knowledge building or capability upskilling right uh, we are also looking for partners who are able to tap into a community, right, uh, to further uh, develop our social finance proposition. And also, we are looking for fintech providers with innovative products and services that brings together uh, with them the alternative scorecard, the alternative financing, and especially into wealth management, right? And uh, well, with that, that covers my session uh, for today or my sharing for today and uh, and uh, really looking forward for those who are interested uh, for collaboration you know you can just drop a line uh, into our mailbox here which is cdx.punishyatbangislam.com.my maybe I'll just copy and paste this for for the benefit of everyone yeah all right thank you back to you Ian right thank you so much and Zary. so i think we have a couple of questions here uh, sure. from the crowd uh one comment here by arif i think just now when you were mentioning about language barrier right so arif was mentioning that language barrier is another thing but most financial events or programs in this country are actually held in english uh do you have any comments on that Ajay? all right uh yeah, maybe maybe we should also start uh, proliferating uh, our mother tongue as well to run through all this uh, uh, knowledge sharing session. Uh, yep, maybe the organizers out there can take note of this. But I do think that there are some that is being run, uh, you know, in, in the Malay language or, you know, otherwise. Yeah. All right, uh, moving on to our next question by Akmal. Um, what are some of the requirements or expectations that Bank Islam looks out for when deciding whether or not to integrate or collaborate with a startup? Ah, that's that's a great question. <laughs> uh, so yes, within within uh, our organization, we do have a framework, and uh, we are looking at, as I mentioned, uh, obviously we have key prioritized areas. Uh, so the key prioritized areas were those that uh, is on the uh, is on the uh, slide uh, right now. Um, we also look into uh, how sound uh, is your organization, right? Uh, we are not uh, discounting the fact uh, that some of you guys can be startups. No, that's uh, we we do consider startups as well, but we really look into the uh quality of the setup uh who is part of the management uh, how big or how large is the visibility of your solution to the market uh and how relevant it is uh to to bank islam uh, especially to our key prioritized areas 
Got it. Thanks so much, uh, Zarin. Hope that answers your question, uh, Akmal. Uh, next question we have is from Marcus. How can we encourage more startups and corporations mm. to work together here in Malaysia, especially with all the bureaucracies present? Great question, Marcus. And I think uh, we didn't uh, sessions that have been organized by LEAD. This is something that has been uh, popping up many, many times, I believe. <laughs> right. Uh, so I think for corporations, first and foremost, for corporations, we, we need to have this particular mind mindset uh, shift, right? Uh, that that innovation sometimes comes from the outside, right? While organizations like Bank Islam, we are sizable and and uh, we we obviously have that uh, that responsibility to our customers. Uh, currently, right? So it becomes an innovator's dilemma, right? Sometimes it's it's the new sort of innovation that will have traction for, for, for the years to come. And that obviously will be coming from the fintechs or startups uh, like, like, like you guys, right? So yeah, corporations need to start uh, realizing this, that uh, uh, yes, organizations, sound organizations uh, like, like uh, Bank Islam, Yes, we do have our strength, but uh, in this very much agile uh, market uh, and environment, right, uh, the startups and the fintechs do have merit with the proposals because they are very, very much closer to the ground and to the customers that we have yet to address, right? So that's one. Uh, and I think it's, it's really about, for the startups, it's really about getting to know... Um, uh, on uh, getting to know uh, programs like FWD Startups. And I think there are other more uh, events, for example, Magic uh, that is being done by MDAC, uh, Lead Ventures has have a few. And this is where these organizations or these agencies will try to uh, sync up with organizations like Bank Islam who has the appetite to cooperate together, right? Uh, and yes uh bureaucracies will never will never be uh, avoided within organizations uh which is regulated and governed such as bank islam but we do have our framework how uh do we uh, manage uh the partnerships yeah with, with fintechs and startups yeah great thanks so much and sheikh zarin i uh, hope that answers your question marcus uh following question by chris most banks in Malaysia have commercial banks and Islamic banks. Um, I think Chris wants to clarify, does Bank Islam also have commercial banks? All right. So uh, I think uh, Bank Islam, we're a bank, uh, period. Obviously, we are focused on retail, but we do have capital market. We do have corporate and uh, commercial banking as well, uh, if, if you're asking, right? But uh, primarily, we are a retail bank but yes as i mentioned that's why we do have certain uh proposition uh for the commercial and the smes as well so yes we do we do commercial banking as well uh chris all right uh thank you so much for that uh next question here um there is still a general misconception among the public that islamic financial institutions are introducing additional fees which may be mistaken as mm. rehab. This is primarily due to the lack of awareness and education in place. How do how does an established Islamic financial institution like Bank Islam debunk these assumptions? And what are some of the ongoing initiatives in spreading awareness? All right. Thank you, Ashikin. Yep, I, I, I think that's also quite a heated topic uh, nowadays uh, about understanding uh, the layers uh, of fees that is involved or the profits that is involved within a uh, Islamic financial products, right? Uh, so I think this is a continuous awareness uh, that, that we are trying to uh, do. Hence why if you see that uh, financial literacy is one of the key prioritized areas that we're putting out there, right? Uh, so we do have... Uh, uh, I mean, within the market, that's, that's Islamic markets who, who does have content on about, you know, what are the components of riba, what uh, makes uh, an Islamic, uh, what makes a product, a financial product, uh, Sharia compliant and whatnot, right? But sometimes it does get too technical. So what we are trying to do is also, again, trying to 
uh, make it make literacy make knowledge more accessible and more uh, easily understandable by by the common uh, people I, actually even even for for people like me i am a software engineer by <laughs> by training right uh, so it it does takes a lot of learning and and it is quite actually quite quite technical trying to understand the sharia uh, contracts right uh, about understanding uh, you know what what are the components uh, of it so to answer you i would say that uh, again we are even looking out for partnerships uh, that will help us uh, to to build a program of financial literacy especially in uh, islamic uh, finance uh, and the other things that we're, we're trying to do is actually to create more uh, easily understood uh, collaterals and literature within our channels uh, for people to re actually understand you know what are the components because right now i i do have to admit that for most banks uh, the only way for you to actually know is when you go when you read through the terms and conditions right there is mm, uh, not many accessible sort of maybe infographics or a layman sort of uh, content to actually explain uh, what are the components within a uh, Sharia contract. Uh, thank you so much for the answer and Sheikh Zarin. Next question here by TK. Um, what are some of the unique benefits that users will gain from choosing Islamic uh, fin financial institutions as opposed to conventional banking in terms of making loans? Hmm, right. Uh, so I think first and foremost, uh, Islamic FIs, we do not provide any loans. We provide uh, financing. So that's the intent of the uh, Sharia contract structure where we... Uh, when where we enter into a uh, business uh, arrangement uh, with you right uh, so well first and foremost the benefit for muslim uh, customers is that uh, it is it is uh, what is required of them that uh, you know they they need to uh, um, execute the livelihood through halal uh, uh, through to halal um, manners uh, to I mean through halal processions right uh, but if we can see the unique benefits uh, for for Islamic FIs uh, sometimes it could be that in terms of how the uh, contract is being structured where uh, you know um, it is very very sound uh, it is really on the basis of, of an asset uh, so i think uh, this is something that you i i mean all of us could could uh, really uh, uh, see during the double whammy during the subprime crisis uh, the islamic financial uh, industry did not collapse uh, because we did not partake uh, into subprime or we do not partake of uh, buying and selling of debts right uh, so it's really about the elimination or reducing the risk uh, for both for the institution as well as the customers. So I think that's that's one of the unique benefit uh, as opposed to conventional uh, banking is that you know that uh, any uh, decision that uh, an Islamic financial institution make is really sound and, and uh, really risk adverse. Thank you so much for the answer, Anshik Zarin. Um, final question here by Michael. I recall that a few financial institutions are looking into integrating Islamic banking and sustainability financing frameworks. Are there any successful case studies so far? And how much are banks willing to pay for such initiatives? Oh, that's that's really a great uh, question, Michael. Yes. So, yes. Uh, uh, if you recall, I did mention just now... Uh, uh, that uh, the Islamic FIs within Malaysia right now, we are upholding uh, uh, a concept called uh, value-based intimidation, right? So this is where 
we are integrating uh, sustainability financing uh, framework within uh, Islamic banking. We are also uh, starting uh, our journey towards uh, integrating ESG uh, into our financing framework as well, right? So that will uh, take into account uh, the they will take into account uh, the management of our portfolios of our asset and and the sectors that that uh, we look into, right? Uh, I would say that there will be some case studies that will be available soon. Uh, I am not uh, able to uh, uh, comment much because I myself have not read the, the reports, but uh, our IAR uh, report for Bank Islam will be coming out, I think, sometime in April, right? Uh, so hopefully there will be mentions of uh, successful case studies there. Right, I, I do have a few on top of my mind, Michael, but I'm not really sure whether I am at liberty to share those case studies. So I would rather wait for the IAR uh, 2021 coming out in April uh, to go through uh, the to go through the uh, successful case studies and how much are banks willing to pay for such initiatives? Well, uh, within Bank Islam, we believe that sustainability financing is the only way forward. Right. Uh, and, and uh, we have created our own unit, as I mentioned, we are now integrating ESG into, into our financing framework as well, apart from really adopting uh, our VBI value-based intimidation pr uh, principles, right? Uh, so I think, yes, we are investing uh, quite a bit uh, for us to actually make that shift uh, to sustainability financing and as well as ESG. All right. Well, thank you so much, and Sheikh Zarin. I believe those are all the questions for today. Uh, thank you so much, and Sheikh Zarin, for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, I believe thank you for having uh, me today. Yes, thank you so much. I believe um, all of us have benefited uh, greatly from this session. Um, once again, I would just like to thank um, all our speakers who joined us today, uh, Dr. Kinan, uh, Nuro Alpha, as well as and Sheikh Zarin. Um, last but not least, uh, before we end today's session, I would actually like to introduce all of you to the FWD Startup Studio Pre-Accelerator Program. So as mentioned by Zahan earlier, um, we are actually opening our third cohort uh, this coming April. So if you have a startup or an idea uh, in fintech, insurtech, takaful tech, or even Islamic fintech that you would like to grow and develop, uh, welcome. We welcome you to join our pre-accelerator program. And I believe my colleague Erin has already shared uh, the link uh, in the chat box. Um, so through this program, uh, you will be able to gain knowledge on product development, customer, customer development, market development, and also gain access to key financial industry leaders, funding, and also mentorship support. So you may either click on the link in the chat box or scan this QR code if you would like to sign up for our pre-accelerator program. And the top winners of the program will actually walk away with um, 150,000 ringgit in investments. And of course, uh, on the topic of Islamic fintech, we are actually having another Islamic fintech event uh, two weeks later uh, by Ruslina Ramli, also a leader in the Islamic fintech space here in Malaysia. So if you're interested in signing up for this event, uh, please do click on the link in the chat box as well uh, for Islamic fintech deep dive by Ruslina. And um, if you're interested, you know, in the overall Malaysia startup ecosystem and you want to know who is building what uh, in our startup ecosystem, do visit our website here, muruku.com. So Muruku is a one-stop platform for any startup-related data, insights, news, and resources. And we will constantly be updating Muruku with the latest startups in Malaysia, any grants available for startups to apply for, um, any venture capitalists uh, for you to acquire funding and also startup related events. So uh, do click on the link in the chat or scan this QR code. Uh, last but not least, uh, we want to thank all of you for attending and participating in today's event. We really hope that today's session was useful, valuable and interesting for you. Uh, do help us um, by filling up the feedback form below via the QR code or the link in the chat. Uh, so that we can improve on our future events. And please do join us in all our future FWD Startup Studio events. Uh, we would love to see you again. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, yeah, so we, and there's a question from Chris. He says he's already signed up, but haven't received a response. 
Oh, hi, Chris. Um, so you've signed up for the pre-accelerator. Um, let me just drop my email here in the chat. So uh, you may email me for any um, further questions regarding the pre-accelerator. And if you've signed up, uh, we will actually be contacting you soon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Please do fill in the feedback form. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for making time. See you in the Thank next you. one. Bye. Bye.